there were early misconceptions in the first half of the 20th century about blood pressure. High blood pressure, dubbed essential hypertension, was considered important to force blood through arteries and it considered harmful to lower blood pressure. Roosevelt sat in his living room with his two cousins and Lucy Mercer. On April 12, 1945, President Franklin Roosevelt is at his retreat in Warm Springs, Georgia, recuperating from exhausting travels overseas. While artist Elizabeth Shalmatov painted his portrait. At one o'clock in the afternoon, FDR collapses in his living room. By 3.35 p.m., America's longest serving president is dead. Before the president, before the presidency, FDR's blood pressure was 140 over 100. Today, healthy blood pressure is considered to be less than 120 over 80. So therefore, 140 over 100 is today considered high blood pressure. One year before his death, his blood pressure was 210 over 120. Today, this is called hypertensive crisis and emergency care is needed. On the other hand, FDR's personal physician said a moderate degree of arteriosclerosis, although no more than normal for a man of his age. Two months before his death, his blood pressure was 260 over 150, and the day of his death was 300 over 190. Today, of course, we know better. In the words of Daniel Levy, the Framingham Heart Study Director, where he says, today, presidential blood pressure numbers like FDRs would send the country's leading doctors racing down hallways, whisking the nation's leader into the cardiac care unit of Bethesda Naval Hospital. So how do we learn? In the 1940s, in the late 1940s, the US government set out to better understand cardiovascular disease. The plan was to track a large cohort of initially healthy patients over their lifetimes. So first of all, this study started in 1948. Uh, at that time, Framingham, Massachusetts, which is located about 10 miles west of here in Boston, in some sense was a typical American town. It had some urban aspects to it, some rural aspects to it. It had been involved in previous study, I believe, involving a tuberculosis study. So the people were, were willing to be interviewed and be involved in, in, in research studies. So at that time, investigators wanted to, to answer the question, what are the risk factors for developing cardiovascular disease, stroke and heart disease, in other words? So the main goal of this study was to identify the risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So in 1948, Framingham enrolled 5,209 men and women aged 30 to 62 living in the town of Framingham, Massachusetts. Why do you think they enrolled people between the ages of 30 and 62? Why not enroll anybody under 30, 25 year olds? Why not enroll anybody older than 62, 70 year olds? Well, we epidemiologists have a dark side. We want to observe disease outcomes occurring among people. The plan for the Framingham Heart Study was to enroll people in 1948, follow them for 20 years, and see who develops heart disease, who develops stroke. Well, 20 years is a long time to follow people. And if you're going to follow people for 20 years as an epidemiologist, you're hoping to observe cases of stroke, cases of heart disease occurring from these people. The reason they didn't enroll any 20-year-olds is because they thought they were relatively fit, unlikely to develop heart disease for the next 20 years, unlikely to develop stroke for the next 20 years. Enrolling such people would be very inefficient. And that's why they decided to enroll people who were at least 30 years of age. But if that logic is true, why didn't they enroll any 70-year-olds or 80-year-old people? Remember, they only enrolled people up to the age of 62. If I enroll 70-year-old people, I'd expect more of them to develop heart disease or stroke than 40, 50, 30-year-old people. Well, my understanding is the reason they didn't enroll 65-year-olds or 70-year-olds or 80-year-olds was because at that time, they thought anybody of that age had already developed signs and symptoms of heart disease. 
hardening of the arteries, as it was referred, atherosclerosis. So they want to enroll people free of the disease to see the development of disease among those people over the next 20 years of follow-up. And if people already had that disease at 1948, there's no reason to enroll them in that study because they're not going to be able to be useful to answer the question, what are the risk factors for causing that disease if, in fact, they already have it? So they enrolled people 30 to 62 years old. They were free of, cord of cardiovascular disease and any symptoms of cardiovascular disease. And the plan was to follow them for 20 years and record these outcomes, the development of stroke, the development of hypertension, the development of, cardi of coronary heart disease. Well, how do they record these outcomes? Well, every two years, participants are asked to return to a testing center where they are examined. Their histories are recorded, their risk factors are updated, their outcomes are updated. They are asked, since the last time we saw you, has anyone told you that you've developed a heart attack or a stroke? They'll measure their blood pressure to see if it, they now have been uh, high blood pressure, falling into a category of hypertension. So the ways to measure those outcomes was by personal testing, personal interview. Among their major findings, their milestones, smoking, not surprisingly, is a risk factor for heart disease. So why don't you smoke? Why is smoking now considered a, a bad habit? It's because the Framingham Heart Study and other studies, other epidemiology studies, showed a link between smoking and the development of coronary heart disease. They were the ones who showed relationships between blood pressure and cholesterol, total cholesterol, as risk factors for increasing your risk of heart disease. They showed that physical activity was good for you. It lowers your risk of heart disease. They showed the components of total cholesterol, HDL and LDL, the good cholesterol, the HDL, high levels that actually decrease your risk of heart disease. They develop prediction rules. You can go to their website and you can predict your risk of developing a heart attack in the next 10 years by plugging in your values for certain risk factors. And they have many, many more results that you can see on their webpage.